lab six, we will be getting back into the microscope and you guys are gonna actually be looking at structures within the cells and measuring their size. Before we get into the introductory material for this lab, I'm sure that you are finishing that quiz that covers lab five material. So let's go ahead and get into our introductory stuff. So this week in lab, we are going back to the microscope and we are going to be using specifically electron microscopy in order to examine cell structure and to measure the structures that we find, the size of the structures that we find inside the cell. And there are two big objectives that we have with today's lab. Um, first, you will be um, becoming familiar with what is called the oil immersion lens or the 100X objective we'll be using that lens to look at a slide of bacteria to estimate bacterial size. And really the majority of your lab, you'll be looking at micrographs of various cell structures taken by um, both scanning and transmission electron microscopes. And you're gonna use those microscopes to both identify various cell structures, but also to calculate cell sizes. Um, so have some math again this week, but a lot of it is math we've already used, and I'm going to kind of show you how to how to use that. But since we are looking at the cell, and since we're going to start discussing the structures that we find inside the cell, I think it's useful to introduce you to some of the key ideas that exist around biology and our understanding of the cell. So there are many biological theories that you will learn as you kind of move through both 1080 but also Bio 2 if you take that in future semesters. And you'll see that biology has four primary theories that are widely accepted by scientists in biology today. The theory that we're going to focus on today is the cell theory, but we also have these theories that include the molecular basis of inheritance, the diversity of life, and the unity of life. But today, for the cell theory, that theory really helps to explain what a cell is and why it is so critical to life. So remember from our microscope lecture that we talked about the microscope and how it was developed. And in 1665, Robert Hooke was a scientist who used the microscope, one of those early versions, to look at cells in cork. Um, cork that we use kind of in our wine bottles or like fancy jars actually comes from plants and so it is made of cells and when Robert Hooke was looking at the structure of cork he noticed that what and just like we've seen that plant cells organize themselves kind of into these boxy shapes and he thought they looked like the cells that monks lived in in monasteries at the time and so that's where the name cell comes from. And so he, Hook is credited with first observing these cells and then later um, Schleiden and Schwann, which I think are two really fun names to say, used um, Hook's observations as well as other scientists observations to develop what is now called the cell theory. And the cell theory states three things. Um, first off, it says that all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Um, you have to have at least one cell to be considered a living thing. And so because of that, the cell can really be thought of as the basic unit of life. And it's now known as well that chemical reactions happen in the cells, and those chemical reactions keep the cell alive. And third and finally, and something we'll see when we get into later labs, especially when we talk about the process of mitosis, we will see that all cells have to arise from pre-existing cells. So cells don't just spontaneously pop out of nowhere. We need kind of an original parent cell in order to create new cells. But we'll talk about that in a, in a later lab. So this is the cell theory. Along with these ideas that are posed in the cell theory, there is one other idea that cells have to perform in order to be considered a, a cell that can survive, and that is that cells must be able to accomplish what is called the central dogma of genetics. Um, a dogma is just something that has been shown countless times to be true and so is now accepted as fact, but what the central dogma of genetics is in biology 
is that we have DNA, which stores information. And DNA can be used to create RNA, which is then used to create proteins. And being able to perform this kind of series of reactions or series of processes in the cell, as well as having a cell membrane, is crucial to allowing a cell to survive. Okay, so the cell is the basic unit of life. Cells are required to be considered a living thing. They have to have DNA that can be transcribed into RNA, that can be made into proteins. They have to have a cell membrane. Well, there's lots of different, there's a huge diversity of life, right? And all of life is made of cells. So this diagram here on the right shows how life is broken up into six kingdoms. Um, with animalia or animals at the top, um, plantae or plants, fungi, protista, and then archaea and bacteria here at the bottom. And the way that they are organized is the simplest life forms or simplest kind of cell types are on the bottom and the more complex types are on the top. And as we can see, there is a huge wide diversity of cellular life and cells themselves can actually be organized based on what we find inside the cells. And in these kingdoms of life, cells or these kingdoms are organized by the type of cell that makes up those kingdoms. For example, the bacteria and archaea bacteria constitute the prokaryotes. So these life forms are made from prokaryotic cells. So let's look at what prokaryotic cells actually are. So prokaryotic cells are considered kind of the most simple cell that we know about um, today. They are all microscopic. You have to have a microscope in order to see these. And prokaryotic cells tend to make up one-celled or single or unicellular organisms. Um, the prefix pro means before and cary means nucleus. So one of the defining features about prokaryotic cells is the fact that they do not have a nucleus. Um, a nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle inside the cell that typically protects DNA. Um, but prokaryotes don't have that. They don't have any membrane-bound organelles. Um, what they do have, though, is DNA. So again, they have to be able to perform that central dogma of genetics, so they have DNA. Um, they have ribosomes. Ribosomes are also required in that central dogma. And just like we saw that we need a plasma membrane to survive, so do prokaryotic cells. In addition to their cell wall, or plasma membrane, sorry, prokaryotic cells also typically tend to have a cell wall. This just adds some extra protection to these, these single-celled organisms. And prokaryotic cells are found in the organisms that make up the archaea bacteria and eubacteria kingdoms. So just to give you an example of what those look like or what where we kind of find those on our planet. Archaea bacteria tend to be extremophiles, meaning they live in extreme environments like hot springs or sulfur springs um, that we find in Yellowstone. These, uh, it's actually amazing that we even find life forms in these geysers at all um, because the sulfur content would be typically poisonous and would kill most other life, but archaea bacteria have found a way to survive. Um, again, these are all unicellular organisms. Um, they also, they lack a nucleus, they lack organelles, um, but they are, so they are all prokaryotic cells. U bacteria or true bacteria are what you guys are actually going to be looking at today in the lab. Um, most bacteria fall under the U bacteria category. Um, archaea bacteria um, or archaic or kind of the ancient bacteria are a more recently discovered kingdom. Um, all bacteria, most bacteria fall under the U bacteria, U bacteria, excuse me, category. Um, these organisms are also microscopic and they are unicellular. Um, they also are, are a huge diverse kingdom. There are 10 million to 1 billion different species of bacteria. Again, they don't have nuclei, but they do have cell walls, which 
is great um, for antibiotics. If you've ever had a bacterial infection, you've probably been prescribed antibiotics. Typically, those antibiotics actually target the cell wall. Our cells don't have a cell wall, we only have a plasma membrane. So these drugs target something that is specific to the bacteria and allows those bacteria to be destroyed so that they don't make us sick um, anymore. You guys are going to be looking at bacteria today in the lab. Um, and again, these are very small organisms. Um, there's actually an error here. They range anywhere from being 1 to one to, to 10 micrometers, not millimeters. Um, most bacteria are heterotrophic, uh, meaning they have to eat other life sources to get their food. Um, autotrophs, like plants, auto means self. Um, autotrophic animals can make their own food, but heterotrophs have to eat something else in order to get their nutrition. Um, there are three types of bacteria in terms of their shapes that you guys are going to be looking at today in the lab, and those are bacillus, which are kind of these rod-shaped structures, caucus, which is a circular structure, and then spirillum, which looks like a spiral or kind of snake-like structure. And today, looking at these microscopic images, you guys are going to be determining or estimating the size of a bacteria, and it should fall in this range between 1 to 10 microns. So those are the prokaryotics. They're relatively simple. Um, they don't have any organelles. They are all single-celled organisms. They um, can live in very extreme environments. They also make up a very diverse kingdom of life. Let's now look at eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells. The eukaryotic cells are really what you probably think of when you think of a cell. Um, these are the cells that we've all learned from you know, middle school to high school biology. Typically eukaryotic cells are more complex um, because they do contain organelles and they're usually larger than prokaryotic cells as well. Um, the prefix eu or u means true and carry again meaning nucleus. So these organisms, these types of cells, all contain a nucleus. And that nucleus is really important, and so it can be divided into these substructures that I've underlined here. But the nucleus is always going to be found near the center of the cell, and it contains the DNA. In addition to the nucleus, there are also many different types of membrane-bound organelles inside a eukaryotic cell. So everything from like the Golgi body, to the mitochondrion, to the endoplasmic reticulum, to the lysosome, to the peroxisome. We have lots of these different membrane-bound organelles. Each has a very specific job that allows these cells to stay alive. Most of the domains of life may, are made from eukaryotic cells, or sorry, most of the kingdoms of life. Um, so we have kingdoms like protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia, that are all made from eukaryotic cells. And so the eukaryotes really represent another diverse group of organisms. And because we're looking at everything from say an amoeba to an elephant, um, the cell types that we find in these different kingdoms can be very different in their size. And that's what this figure here on the right is highlighting, that most animal cells, most plant and animal cells are going to range from anywhere from 10 microns to 100 microns, while again, bacteria should be in the 10 to 1 micron range. Um, organelles also fit in this range as well. Remember, organelles fit inside a cell, so they need to be smaller than most of our cells. Um, I also want to point out that notice that both bacteria and plants fall under requiring a light microscope in order to see. Um, we're going to look at an electron microscope here in a moment, and we're going to see how this gives us a much better magnification power. But one of the things that we're going to be doing today, again, is converting using the metric system. So this table here can be really helpful in helping you to convert units today. I'm going to show you another trick that I did not show you in our previous microscope lab as well for how to convert. 
Um, but most of your lab today is going to be estimating cell size and specifically organelle size inside those cells. And so um, let's actually look at kind of what we're going to be doing today, both how to use the microscope, but also how to estimate and calculate cell size. So for the first part of this lab, when you guys are looking at bacteria, if we were in person, um, I would show you how to use what is called the oil immersion lens, or this is the 100x objective in our lab. Um, because you are just going to be provided pictures, I'm going to skip these instructions. Um, but if you ever do need to use a microscope, the instructions for how to um, use the oil immersion lens are here. Um, basically what happens with the 100x objective, and you can see it here in this bottom image labeled number three, um, this objective is so large that it comes very, very close to touching your slide. And in order to protect that objective, we usually put a drop of oil on the surface of our slide to help kind of lubricate the surface. It also allows this image to be a lot sharper. And the reason that we use the oil immersion lens is because it gives us a really great magnification power. So remember, for total magnification, we always take the magnification of the eyepiece and multiply that to the magnification of the objective lens. Our eyepiece is always 10, and our oil immersion lens in this example is 100 times. So our total magnification when we look or when we use this objective is a thousand times. And you can see from the figures on the right that using that oil immersion lens can give you a much clearer picture of a small organism like a bacteria. For instance, these are our caucus bacteria that you're going to be seeing in the lab today. Notice under 400 total magnification. You can see these structures, but not super well. But if you zoom in to a thousand times magnified, you can see those structures really clearly. Um, I want to point out that notice you'll, you'll be seeing this too, that bacteria like to kind of clump together. Um, these clumps are often referred to as colonies and they actually represent clones. So every single one, every single bacteria in this colony is probably a clone of each other. The, this colony might be slightly different from this colony here on the, on the right, but within a colony, those bacteria are identical. So they sometimes look like they're multicellular, but they're, they're really not. They're unicellular. They're just kind of clumping and living together in this colony. And what you're going to be doing when you're looking at these images is you'll be estimating the size of these individual bacteria. So as a reminder, we've done this before, but I wanted to remind you quickly of how we estimate cell size um, based on the diameter of our field of view. So for example, um, let's say that we are looking at the microscope image here on the right, and let's say this is the 100x objective, and we have figured out that we the diameter of the field of view is 0.4 millimeters. Remember that when we are trying to estimate the size of our cells, we have to estimate roughly how many cells we think could fit across this diameter. Well, right now I have these two cells here that are sitting kind of smack dab in the middle of my field of view, but I have this white space here on the left and the right. So if I kind of, with my mind, kind of push these cells to the right, I would imagine that it looks like I could fit like, probably a third cell in that open space. And so for step number one, estimate how many cells lie along the diameter of the field of view, I'm going to say that I could fit probably three cells here. I'm going to use that number for step two to calculate the approximate diameter of each cell. And remember, what we do is we're going to take our field of view diameter and we divide that by the number of cells we think fit across that diameter. So my diameter, I've told you, is 0 0.4 millimeters. And I think that I can I could fit three cells here. So when I divide that 0 0.4 by 3, I'm going to get 0 0.13 millimeters. 
or if I convert that times a thousand would be 130 micrometers. So similar, oops, sorry, too, too many squiggles for that M. So very similar to what we talked about um, when, we, when I reviewed that quiz question with you guys last week. Um, we're just, we're taking the diameter of our field of view and dividing it by the number of cells that we think could fit across our, our field of view. And that's what you're going to be doing for estimating the bacteria size. For the majority of lab, um, what you're actually going to be doing is physically calculating cell and organelle size. And to do that, you're going to be looking at electron micrographs. So we've talked briefly about electron microscopes in our first microscope lab together. Um, remember that the electron microscope uses electron beams and it focuses, it basically shines electrons on a specimen and those electrons are either absorbed or reflected back. And a computer can make two different images. If we're using a transmission electron micrograph, we can get a flat or 2D image like we see here on the right, on the bottom right. Scanning electron micrographs create a 3D image, usually of like the surface of a cell that we see here on the upper right. We're gonna be looking mostly at transmission electron micrographs today. And when we do that, the whole goal of this is to calculate the cell and organelle size of those structures that you're asked to calculate. So the math that we're gonna do for this is really easy. This is the formula that you guys are gonna be using today in lab. We're gonna take the magnified size and that is equal to the actual size times the magnification. So let's look at how we can actually manipulate this to figure out what is the actual size. So a lot of these questions are gonna be using magnified size and magnification to figure out what is the actual size. So first off, we have to start by measuring our object and we're gonna be measuring specifically the magnified size of our object of interest. This is gonna be given to you in the lab. So for example, in the, for this nucleus picture, you're going to be told that the nucleus is 16.4 centimeters. That is the magnified size again. So this is, this is not the real size of a nucleus of 16.4 centimeters would be huge. We would not need a microscope to see that. So what we need to do in order to plug it into this equation that I've boxed is we need to convert that measurement into micrometers. So remember from our talk about the metric system in our previous lab, that one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters and one millimeter is equal to a thousand micrometers. Um, you can also remember too, another useful one is that a one micrometer is equal to a thousand or 1000 nanometers. Those are, these are kind of the three key conversions that you need to remember for this lab. So going back to that conversion math that I taught you in our first microscope lab, remember that we can arrange these ratios as fractions. And remember that we're trying to cancel out units to get to the units that we want. So for instance, if we want to convert to micrometers and I start with centimeters, I'm going to try to do math that allows me to cancel out everything but micrometers. So my one centimeter equals 10 millimeter conversion. I've put that into a fraction here where 10 millimeters is on the top of my fraction, one centimeter is on the bottom. Remember, whole numbers are a fraction over one. So, and whatever's on the top and the bottom cancels out. So my centimeters will cancel out. I'll have converted this to millimeters when I, when I multiply 16.4 by 10. And then I need to convert that to micrometers. So I'm just taking my ratio and I'm organizing it so that microns is on the top, millimeters is on the bottom. Again, those cancel out. And so when I do the math, 16.4 times 10 times 1,000, this tells me that the nucleus is 164,000 microns. 
So that's kind of the first way that I taught you guys or showed you how to convert units. There's another way, it's a little bit, um, I think, simpler for like visual learners. So I wanted to take a second before we go on to step three, I wanted to show you this other way that we can convert units. So I call this way to convert um, the very unscientific name of scoot the decimal. Um, but what we can do with this is that we can remember that our, the metric system changes by units of 10. So for instance, if we start at a base unit, which for length is the meter, if we move to the right, we have different units of 10 that we can, that we can convert to. Um, for instance, one unit away, which I've drawn as a period here, is decimeter or dm. We never use decimeters in biology, so I just, rather than have you worry about what this unit is called, I've just put a placeholder here. And that's what these other dots represent as well. They're just placeholders so that we can remember how far away from a meter centimeters, millimeters, micrometers, and nanometers are. So these are the most common units of measurement that we'll use in biology. So let's go back to our nucleus example. So again, we were told that the nucleus was 16.4 centimeters, and we were asked to convert that to micrometers. So Another way that we can convert is we can just ask ourselves, well, how many units away, how many units of 10 away is microns from centimeters? And so what we can do is I can take my 16.4 and I can count that it is one, I have to include the periods, the placeholders, two, three, four units away. So in order to convert to from centimeters to micrometers, I have to scoot my decimal for units. And specifically because I had to make my loops towards the right, because I, I moved right, that means that I'm going to move my decimal right. So what I would do is I would take 16.4 and I would scoot it one, two, three, four. And everywhere there's an open loop, I'm just going to fill that in with a zero, which gets me to 164,000 microns. So same answer, but rather than do the math, I'm just visually scooting my decimal. You can do this in the opposite direction too. Say you were asked to convert to say nanometers to micrometers. Well, now I'm going to move one, two, three to the left. So I'd need to move my decimal left, so my number will get smaller. So the direction that you have to loop tells you which direction to move your decimal. The number of loops you make tells you how far you move your decimal. But again, both ways are going to get us to that converted measurement of 164 microns. So now what we're going to do is this final step. Now we have enough information to actually calculate the actual size of the nucleus in micrometers. The lab is also going to always tell you what our magnification power is as well. So now all we have to do is plug and chug into our formula up top. So again, my magnified size is the 164,000 microns. My magnification is 28,000 microns. Again, you're gonna be given that. So all we have to do is solve for x. All we have to do is solve for the actual size. And so when we do that, we get that x is equal to 164,000 microns divided by 28,000, which gets us 5.86 microns. And something you can quickly do is check the diagram from the previous slide. Remember that organelles should be between one to 10 microns. So this answer makes sense. I'm, I'm falling right in that range. So that's a way that you can check that your math is making sense. So that's really what you're gonna be doing for a lab today. You're gonna to be looking at these magnified images and you're gonna be manipulating this formula here 
in order to calculate the cell and organelle size. Um, your, after this slide, um, you still have some other slides, and I just want to let you guys know that those are for your reference as you're working through the lab, but also as you're studying for bio 1080 exams or a bio, your first bio 1090 exam as well. Um, I recognize that some of you, depending on your section of 1080, have started talking about the cell. Some of you aren't there yet. And so really slides 25 through 41 are just a reference of the organelles and their functions um, so that while you guys are going through your measurements today, you kind of know what the organelle is and what it does. So these are really just for your reference. You can print them off. You can use them to study later. Um, but I'm not going to go over them in, in this lab. Um, I just wanted to have kind of give those to you as an extra resource for prepping for exams. So at this time, you are welcome to go ahead and get into lab six, and I will see you next week for lab seven.